Yeah, so that's very much. Um, I've been asked to talk about everything, but I'd like to talk about Morris Halliday, specific to who I call ultra, an ultra conservative extraordinaire. Now, Chris Callum's dead now, um, but he was a very interesting man who crossed over all sorts of theoretical boundaries in his career as an academic, and I suppose a sort of radical conservative journalist for many years. Now, I knew him about 10 to 15 years before his death, and he saw the Peter House. Uh, there's a novel by Timothy Snow called The Masters about an election in a Cambridge college, Oxbridge College. I um, mean, the intensity of the political passions at the microscopic level amongst the clever men. And uh, that's very much the movie that the sort of obvious thing which this man moves. He was regarded in some ways as a little bit of a bad guy, but he never was. And I always had the impression that he was with Professor Roger Scruton, who had been different from, but who he resembled in certain respects. So they often wheeled out when people wished to. Uh, damaged the uh, mainstream conservative unionist party. It was well said in the mid or the, the 1980s that Penguin, uh, a book from the top city friendly to the story, published two books. Not the three friends free to choose, The Bible of Chicago School Libertarian Capitalism, and Roger Scruton's The Real Meaning of Conservatism. And they did both of those in some ways to attack the conservative party at that time. And they were going to accuse you of attacking anything when you're publishing intellectual material that's in some way adjacent to the party concern. Now, Morris Dowling was a very rarity individual in all sorts of ways. I'll say a few biographical things about him first, because he's just an interesting man. The first thing is that Callum lived at night. The Callum used to sleep during the day, and he stood at the night. And so when he had an university seminar with him, you'd go and see him at one in the morning. <laughs> so everybody was sort of wrecked, essentially, when they climbed up to his tower to sing it. And the mist would be coming out of the can, and the porter would open his light, and would see him in bed with the porter after the murder, when he'd put the chains on the door, and he's opening the door, and he'd come in there, and this leery old porter looks at you, and says, Professor Crowley, is it, sir? And he'd say, yes, and he'd go up this stairwell, and he'd open the door, and Crowley would be in his hook line room. So I have scenes with Jonathan Harper and Bradford, you know. You go into this room, and there's books on this wall, and books on this wall, and books on this wall, and Karen's lying on the bed. Karen's lying on the bed, dressed in green. And you go in there, and he looks at you, and he says, no, it's you, is it? And in Cambridge, you have to read the echo So he talked about the philosophy, Aristotle, here a guy just played for Aristotle too, Dead parts that he gave in some of the John Rawls in a way, but it's that sort of section. And he would give you these essays, it didn't really relate to the course as such, but you have to do such a large amount of work for it that in a way you were more than educated to sort of get the sort of degree. It wasn't particularly concerned with qualifications. Um, he had all Marx and Engels, he was just invented an essay club, he'd say, Marx, I'm a libertarian libertarian, discuss. And he'd have to go away. Um, and of course what he's talking about is the 1844 manuscripts, the early marks, the differentiations and scientific socialism that come later. The interesting thing about Cowling is that Cowling was a sort of archetype for the sort of dons depicted in Walter House Blue by Tom Sharp. Because of course that comedy called the House in Peter House, and he's talking about the ultra reactionaries in Cambridge. Now Cowling was deeply un-English in certain respects, and deeply English in others. When I say un-English, he was ultra-intellectual. At no time was all talk. Drink one garbage. No, no, no. He lived a part of his family. He lived during the night, and went to the city during the day. Now, if you made an international proposition, you very sensitive to that in your essay, because you had to read it out loud in front of him, and he wrote it. He would attack everything he said. He would attack every proposition, and he would attack every idea behind it. Because he believed in dialectics, he believed in struggles that means the truth. And so you had this war with him, basically, between about 1.30 and quarter to 3 in the morning. And then he'd stagger down at the tower, you know, and another victim would come up <laughs> to the aisles, and you'd see them sneaking up the stairs, you know. It was well known that female students had to be kept away from him. Not for the usual reasons, but because he was a rather stone, especially merciless. 
the sort of damage to the student country to capture weight as well. So they only used to throw in into the gravitorial pit at combat the ones who could take it. And this goes a lot about Morris, and that Morris was a sort of, in some ways, slightly dangerous man, um, certainly for the sort of academic life of that era. I remember George Steiner, he was an American professor of European culture and civilization at Churchill and at Geneva University simultaneously, no, at the same in Cambridge, once said at private party that he regarded my town as evil and a force for evil. And there are various reasons why he might think that personal and otherwise. Now, Morris Carolyn is unusual in that he was a deeply elitist and extremely conservative. Um, and a very intellectually fastidious individual. The interesting thing about him is that he set himself, in a more continental way, against liberalism as a conception. He didn't think of conservatism as a species of liberalism, he thought of conservatism as, in some respect, an anti enlightenment proposition. His thesis, he did quite do a thesis or PhD in the usual way, but he basically thesis his head, a bit like Nietzsche's the tragedy, um, was about John Stuart Mill and was published in General Horror several years later, because he sort of launches himself into an attack upon the middle. His argument about him is quite eccentric, even from the perspective of people who don't care for um, that particular thing, because his view was that, contrary to the idea that men was opening up the world to tolerance and inclusion and freedom of thought and freedom of belief and secularity and sort of a plenitude of sort of milky goodness, he regarded him as an implicit totalitarian a free, and a man who is determined to impose his values and deeds on others, and a militant destroyer of religion, and an aggressive secularist. One of Carolyn's thesis is that, he sees, is that liberalism isn't a nice viewpoint, as everyone imagines, but it acts actually as a varying viewpoint, particularly of prior religious ideas that uphold not the notions of hierarchy in society. So, his second book, was on the use and misuse of the limitations of political science. Some of his early books were very explained, and were one of the reasons he later resumed after a break in that again in Korea. He was afraid of the Second War, Second World War, and he was afraid of the idea of the journalism. But he never really gets started in this journal, because he always had a tendency to write dramatically and use the article about the he always had a tendency to write scandal reviews for people who are in the journal. He always had a tendency to write scandal reviews for people who are in the journal. And you can always imagine, because he was such a fast brain, and quite a lot of reactionary and difficult individual, that very like all the world war is the other to remember those symbols. I remember all that's where it's an article in the Spectator in 1974, arguing for a good guitar in Britain. Which is making it incredibly popular. But as you can say, who wants to be popular? Yeah. Um, and Karen was a bit similar. So he, he was sacked or removed, the expression was, from the express group, because he, the, the editor said, You're too reactionary, so even for us, he said. And this was in the early 60s, which in many ways was quite prior to the culture of Soviet deluge, which was to occur. Um, so he resumes his academic career with these texts in the background on mill and on the uses of politics. And in a strange way, for such a theoretical man, the belief that theory doesn't impinge upon the life and manners and mores of the politicians very much. Now a very complex individual, because although he believes that intellectual ideas dominate life, and intellectuals are the power of power, even though they have no formal power in all societies, if everyone else is up and reuses it to another level of their ideas. He believed that politicians are usually motivated by anything other than principles. <laughs> and Caroline is a strange individual because although he had to create three beliefs of his own, he was also a nihilist. He's essentially an attacker. He had a mind that's often more associated with the left than the right. Because whenever you put a proposition to him, his first um, his first idea will be to attack. To deconstruct, to break down, and to sweep away, and to see if your ideas can stand it. It's a sort of slightly more aggressive version of the Socratic method, whereby you don't put forward your own proposition, you just shoot it away, whatever anyone has said to you, and remain somehow to one side, you know? Uh, of course, you have no place to explicate it all 
uh, he can make it when he may have put it at the time later. So he had to do that for himself. So you've got this strange tension in power between an ultra theoretical view of life and the view that politicians are deliberative roads acting in microscopic ways, particularly in relation to the laws that they have with each other, within cabinets, within parties, and within bureaucracies. But in our power, we believe, particularly in English and British terms, that party was very important. And it was completely dismissive of the modern idea that uh, they were the same, and what does it matter which party people are in. And he liked the idea of the good party man, even though he didn't wish to associate with them because they were a bore. So I think there are other people, of course, which is why the, uh, including Michael Portillo, who the educated and who many people think he proved inventive for the leadership of the Tory party. But when somebody asked Gary McCarthy, what's your view of Michael Portillo, he said, oh, well, you may be living bureaucratic and private business. And that is his view. But he was always slightly sort of condescending, but that everyone did, isn't it? Um, including most of his fellow gods. One of his, just to uh, engage in a little bit of sort of that common sort of remark, uh, one of his favourite sparring partners was Hugh Trevorova, who committed a major faux pas when he authenticated the Get the Diaries in an enormous scandal that went around the world. And Calvin said at the dinner club in Cambridge called the Authenticators. And everybody had to put up their hands when they went to the dinner club and said, I take the Authenticator with my heart. The pro-democracy of these texts. I know he wrote them and I put my entire reputation upon it, which is some stupid thing that wrote them come out of it in the furore that should have never been paid for 12 million Deutsche Marks or whatever they paid for some elderly German forger who forged multiple volumes of this stuff into his own calligraphic set in his garage. You know, and they paid millions and millions for it. Um, the only historian, interestingly, who said, um, uh, they were friends from the beginning of the end, they were living. And it was like a fun way of um, uh, behaving because a couple of weeks ago I went to a garden party to the early day uh, in which he talked about these and other matters. And I suddenly appeared, some people may know, on the United States giving fashion in Westside with many others for appearing at this garden party to go to a Buckinghamshire garden party on a Sunday, you know. The basis of all these things, isn't it? You know, really. But um, uh, now, Cameron had this sort of um, rivalry with uh, Trevor Roper, who, of course, was regarded as a third right expert, because he wrote the famous book about the bunker of the last days. Isn't it? Um, and, but he brawled with all other academics, really, uh, because of his nature. Despite all the comedy and the element of the CP style and reactionary god look like, he wrote three for five very, very serious intellectual courts. So serious that most of the conservative students in the past, for the moment, quote unquote, care, didn't entirely realize what he was saying. My view of Howard is that the idea that he was a mainstream historian where someone like Irving is a demon, a demon in ways falls, I would say in some respect, Howard is the right of Irving. Um, and this is one of the paradoxes which you face in late modernity, where certain people are regarded as beyond the pale of the pale of the pale, other people are regarded as quite mainstream. And it actually is in part because no one really really looks at their ideas. Irving's a nostalgic. He regard this country to be like the 1950s. His uh, faux pas is that he's sort of fallen in love with Abba Bitter, which is a historian to regard as, you know, not one so brilliant move, if you want to be published by the villain. And that was a good one. his career. Uh, Martin <laughs> Gilbert came to Hitler and asked Churchill, and he saw the inverted it, hadn't he? You know? he? He would have been with Churchill's wife, burning a prevalent modernist portrait of Churchill downstairs at the Charles of Alvin, chopping it up and using it as fire. Remember what Churchill said about that painting? He said, it makes me look thick. He said, I haven't. You know, so, um, but Calvin is very, very good at with a complicated right. He had no time for continental overriding views. He believed that the key to the radical and absolutist right of Britain is never really said what it is. And it must come from inside the brain of the Tory party. And he would educate those brains before they entered the cabinet. This is his central theory. His first book was about the Labour government in 1924. 
leading to the later um, involvement in the invasion prior to the crash of 1929, the so-called betrayal of the labor movement, the emergence of some national labor people around that sort of and their induction of color into what was essentially a conservative administration. Now, can a pathological approach to labor influence in modern 20th century life? Because in case if you didn't believe that the masses should have a better democratic representation in the way that they got it, he believed he wasn't going to have particularly well. And he believed in the manipulation of state power by a liberal conservative elite. He believed that Labour would always push everything, even within democratic norms, further and further to the left, because it was the logic of their position. By further and further to the left, he means make more equal. Because how they realised, in the way they're really only continental far right thinkers, like the Ben Modernised, but the real point about the right is yeah, right, isn't concepts like race or religion or nationality, although they would include it in a very significant way. It's in policy. And it's the spiritual goodness, if you like, of inequality. As the founding belief pillar and structure, all of the others aren't discourses, certainly this is how we can build them, or semiotic, through which, and by version of which, you build meaning through inequality. Therefore, he was a sort of conservative who, well, I can say, we call it what you will, who believes that the maximization of inequality, not just material inequality, which is a very low form of inequality, or equality, um, but immaterial forms of uh, equality, social equality, or what about, uh, what, what life is about? Hierarchs of beauty, of form, of intellect, of knowledge. These, and what you are, of course, aristocratic, pre-democratic, anti-mutual Anti-working class, illegal conceptions. He may even come from that background himself, but like Nietzsche, in a differentiated way, he became a spokesman for aristocratic morals in a British setting. This book about the Labour administration in 1934, which is called The Impact of Labour, is incredibly detailed. The letter in the story, as you can tell me, says that all the stories of this generation, how they had the greatest mind, after my own. <laughs> You can't, you can't beat them, can you? <laughs> um, and, uh, but Taylor, who of course was on the founder of Anglican and was on the Committee of 100, the most radical element within CND, with Bertrand Russell and all these people that were all sat in front of the new chair of Howard Mark, and all sat in front of American New Year Bunkers, and all sat in front of the Ministry of Defence, and in front of the government. What they thought they were achieving by sitting in the road, rather than dirty in their sack. Well, I don't really know, but that's what A.G.P. Taylor thought. Taylor himself was a dissident, of course. He wrote a soft revisionist book about the origins of the Second World War called The Devastating Unidentionality, The Origins of the Second World War, which caused immense difficulty and was denounced from all circles. And when expressions denunciations of Taylor came in, Taylor would run to the post box and say, look, there's another one, because he actively loved this sort of gas fire method. Now, his view of Cowling's was very interesting because it comes from the other side, politically. And Cowling would concentrate on the micro politics of Labour figures, where they came from, which chapel they went to, what denomination within Christianity they did or didn't believe in, whether they were an atheist or not, a key eternal or external age, and whether their religious belief was just purely social or whether it had theological basis. Um, these are key elements for Cowling, but also the alliances that people form. Unlike a lot of academic and purely theoretical historians, which in the history is not better, even Marxist historians like Oxford or E.P. Thompson, for example, are deeply empirical in relation to a lot of continental writers, because that seems to be the British historiographical tradition, but which can be definitely experiment. The interesting thing is he understood the texture of power and how politicians behave, particularly under stress, because they're nearly always under stress in one way or another. And uh, his view is that when you allow the centre left into the state, they will have to spend money, they will have to go off the gold standard, they have to introduce social provision for the masses. They have to take care of the people that the Tories don't regard sociologically as part of their nation. They're there to do that. This means the inflation. This means that the economic divisions between the classes will lessen. This means you will have a more egalitarian society, whether you like it or not. Other people will say that's inevitable given the access of the masses into modernity in the 20th century. Later on, 
All those that are the same decade can write another book, Impact of Labour. This was called Impact of Hitler. And this is the British foreign policy. And this is probably the most controversial book, really, and the one which is widely known for outside the purely academic circles. The Impact of Hitler, British diplomacy, foreign policy, 1933 to 1940. It's a very uh, provocative book, in many ways. All of these books were published for the most part by Ken Tudor's Press. Or the University of Chicago brought out the world well edition of this particular book. The thesis of this book is that the British were reacting to the emergence of ferocious new Caesarisms, which is how we looked at Caesar on the European continent in the 1920s and 30s in various ways. Uh, what really mattered were the national factions within the leadership of the Conservative Party. Don't forget, everyone who knows anything about the history of this country during the 30s knows. Churchill and his group were completely outsiders during that period and were regarded as semi lunatics and wild men. It used to be said by one of the Tories in the mid 30s, you're not one of those ghastly Churchill men, are you? You know, where they met people who they thought might be. But Churchill was an outsider who wanted to make trouble and wanted an another enormous bloodbath to Germany, which much of that whole generation was determined to prevent occurring, given the fact that they were either fought in the first one between 1914 and 18 or lived through it, or relatives of theirs who died in it, and so on. Um, what I have in these things, which is deeply uh, unpleasant in relation to mainstream secularized opinion now, or maybe the pop, he was a man who never bothered, whether people thought he was dead and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a degree to which he thinks the whole history of the Second World War and what followed it has been ludicrously sentimentalized and to be focused on. And also, that it is being written from a labour point of view. In other words, the view of the active administration, the view of people who were in opposition, and in quite sort of minor opposition, up until the national governments of 39 and 40, and essentially changing, so it fell. When they came in, the radicals in the Labour Party, people like the young Michael Foote, who wrote his book, straight chat book, straight handbook, called Those Guilty Men, the Appeasers. Uh, he thinks that Labour conquered the mental space in Britain long before they formed in the absolute majority elected dictatorship, which is how you see democracy, um, between 1945 and 1951. Labour, of course, through the Nationality Act of 1948, begins the process of nationalisation, initially from the Old Empire or the Commonwealth, which results in the society we have now. So Calvin believes, or believes, of course, they are with us, that Labour is crucial in its replacement of the Liberal Party as the centre of opposition within the British state and its regime. Um, the interesting thing is that a lot of his analysis of politics is Machiavellian in the sense that power and self-interest on behalf of wider groups are what politics is about. He doesn't believe in any of the, uh, of the um, nicer and more moral constructions that people do it for others, that they do it for the esteem that others will have for them, that they do it in order to serve the public good, as John Major once said, he would die as poor and very rubbish put forward by a political leader. So his view of everything is sort of slightly ferocious and acidic. Um, but his analysis of his country at the time, which is a sort of internalized and microscopic version of very largest statistics in the time of British power, um, which views the same events in a more narrative way, just a wider, less narrow historical continuum. Very, very similar, both upper middle class, growing with the kids going actually up the path and both ultra conservative and wide agreement in culture, both outside of the relations to Britain, which has already been created by the middle of the last century, never mind before. Uh, don't be fooled by the fact there's many leftists for Britain. So there are lots of big W people who still run structures in this society. And the class of rights rules in this country until about 1920 is gone. And we're not shot by the Soviet Union or get the same like revolutionary class that's not here before. But they've gone. And it's now a mass bourgeois liberal society, which in big way of looking at things is being ethically and culturally proletarianized. And that's what you have if you take away the can and the soft wood. And he basically, uh, so that's the thesis of that book. Um, 
The other thing about the book, which shocked a lot of commentators at the time, is there's no moral judgment about Vatican being seen as a ruthless leader, thrown up on the streets, in post-war, quite in post-1918 Germany, um, six million German unemployed, men locked in the doorway, men without feet, men living in cardboard boxes, he offered them hope, he offered them vengeance, he offered them a bit of to to blame it all. He regarded it as axiomatic. I read it with him on the paper he did it. Again, it's a Jim Star. The Jim Star meant had democracy anyway. Um, these are views which almost have never even expressed now. Um, there's also the idea that in a sense that movement represented Prussianism from the streets. But they returned the Second Reich in a very virile, forceful way because it, in fact, it lacked the polish of the old elites. And in many ways, with Britain, he was able to figure out in his team an analysis of that era and of that particular movement, which in many ways is the kind of the movement of the 20th century, really, even today. Um, even though it's clearly a division that literated in 1945, strange how it's still alive, at least in the mental stage that swirls around. Most people couldn't tell you who the law was, couldn't tell you who Roosevelt was. More people know who some supermodels dating than who was Prime Minister in 1940. But they all know about that particular dictator. It's quite strange how it's gone outside history and become a sort of part of the generalised psychopomp and mass culture. And it's always a sign with a historian if they don't play those sort of demonic games. And if they adopt a hard edge and unsentimental attitude, many liberals believe they adopt that attitude because why is it protected to it? In the case of someone like Alan Clark, that was, you knew that very well, that was not um, sort of a completely uncharitable view, to be frank. Um, now, how he wrote this book, in which he basically said we should not have fought, you know, and he knows we're building a Sunday celebrate our market, but we should have done things with the 1941 after we were defeated in France. We should be left to one side, we kept the empire, and we would certainly mercilessly against Stalin's communism and we'll probably defeat it without the other front. This was a revisionist for soft revisionist thesis, but a very revisionist one, for which he was demonized and subject to quite a degree of obviously. But if you look at Marx in a tower, at the Cambridge College, it probably the brick back of outraged polytechnic fortune don't really shut the windows, do they? So he only heard it in a muffled war of distance, really. That was certainly the most quote unquote demonic and near the edge word housing it did. Um, it's interesting to know that it was sold by all sorts of groups all over the world, way beyond the portals of Chicago University Press or Kent University. The most extreme national socialist organization in the United States, which is called the National Alliance, and was led by Dr. William Pierce, actually sold Morris Cowling, um, the diplomatic response to Hitler. Um, it could be understood intellectually where it was coming from, even in a dissension climate. So, in a way, Cowling is prepared to be heretical. Cowling is prepared to do what stop methods do. We basically say, there are no enemies on the left. And when J.S. Short once said, when communism has been destroyed, communism has been defeated, communism has gone down. But Marxism is not been defeated. That's in many ways the difference between the left and the right. But moderate leftists, who do not like the politics of communism, its harshness, their totalitarianism, their suspiciousness, its use of brutality, are its wrong. They take their politics. They don't like this. Overall, it's very nice and it's But they are prepared to look at, to think about, and to use the theoretical ideas of an enormous range of artists, from Gramsci to Adorno to Grekinov and so on. They're not frightened with ideas. Whereas the conservative tradition largely, you know, students on open shop will write, but if you go further out than that, it's regarded as terrifying and sort of you'll be brought up in with the devil, you know. And you have to have a very long speed in order to do that. So, in a sense, he's reacting against that type of hypocrisy. The idea that some ideas are respectable and others are not, where the stars are concerned, they're all ideas. Um, and many of them mask the urgency of power. Now, one critique of power, which certain liberals were not slow to make, he said these were a matter of both life. Um, well, there was a sort of nihilistic structuralism to this that, that, in a way, 
What are the absolutes that he believes in? I've once said that he's a Tory, aren't they? And he's laughed. Um, which is a sort of an endorsement. And there's a complicated uh, element going on there. Um, although he believed that socialised religion was, inevitable, was, was necessary to hold civilization together, and its loss through secular erosion and relativism in this science day was what led to what we got. That was his view. How firm his own beliefs were in high Anglican Christianity is difficult to say. But of course, there are right wing forms of personalised skepticism or atheism or just non committal through the decade private, with, which are different to the left wing and liberal versions of those forms. The leader of French and Central Nationalism in the 20th century, Sandra Charles Morin, leading a French fundamentalist near the Catholicism, really, here yeah, privately, not probably an atheist. Why? Because certain people of this temper can't believe themselves. They don't believe the structure of their structure of their civilization should be torn down just because they have a private disbelief. So they are constructivists. In other words, they don't believe that all of history is reduced into my consciousness about it at a particular moment, because one's part of an interconnected continuum that pre exists one and that will post date one. And so although one's private views are important to oneself and to one's circle and so on, they are not necessarily culturally determining factors. And that's an interesting attitude because it, it means that even people who are skeptical about the Christian inheritance, which you could say the vast majority of socialist minded and liberal minded and violent minded intellectuals and then feminists and other land writers later, all work, don't necessarily have to then go on to me that you tear the whole thing down. Enoch Powell, who had a little bit of a parallel career in science politics, too badly. Both ultra intellectual, both scare, spare, both slightly puritanical men, both aesthetic, uh, both very hard mind on the nature of their personal discourse and thinking, just mind to mind. Um, Powerful speak ten languages, and wrote ten to twenty academic books, and yet didn't really have a proper academic career, and just loved the women people. His last book at the end of that right being Stone Drive and Prison Pipe. It's just miles sorts of people he knew. Because they gaslight like these sorts of things. They did like causing trouble. And that's just part of who and what they are. And there's an interesting parallelism at another level. How was very influenced by Nietzsche when he was young. Very much so. And as a sort of ruthlessness and ferocity of back thinking. And as racism of back thinking certainly appealed to emotion. But he later softened and moved away from there. I think, and Carolyn never so formally influenced by Nietzsche, because it was a part of an accident state the continental Europeans in that very old English sort of British way, even though mentally he was very aware of their achievements. So he could say, but he would argue the identity of Nietzsche one. And that was part of his strength. He said, he said, he went to explain, I don't mind a spot of bigotry in that. He said, as long as it's in a good cause. <laughs> and, uh, and there were all these sort of Johnsonian type swords, you know, that were always there in the background, because he regarded them as part of uh, having an earth, rather than just a floating sort of semi visual definition of identity. One of the things that's very important about all these figures is that they're great characters. One thing you'll notice about the English British life now is how leveled down people are. The great monstrous characters of the past you know, seem fewer and fewer. And many of the attitudes that they had, their cragginess, their difficulty, their indomitable character and so on, seems to have disappeared as well. In these just three people, I mentioned how, how, and you have these sorts of figures. There's just no link to it. There's, um, there's just no way around it. Now, on the positive side, not what you're against and what you do to struggle, what you build. How do you move back to a Christian position? I mean, that may not be the correct and may not really renounce it in the way Carl did earlier, so there's less of a mental moving back. But still, his last three books, which appeared in the 1980s, 1990s, and the first uh, year of this, uh, in the end of 2001, um, were books about the Anglican Church and its ideas and its ideology, as you can see there, its theological praxis, that gets to the Church, which in many ways is a combination of different things to be one, 
with a national compromise contained the Protestant and American element, contained the semi nationalist uh, Protestant Confederacy, the establishment there, and almost had no police. Uh, they set the prison of power with a minority in the background, had an Anglo Catholic wing, of course, and I've been formerly left for the Roman Church now, and it's a mainly from a hardline theological point of view, it's a dog's breakfast of an organization, for political reasons, where the Protestants and the Catholics pull at either end, but those of them are lying against the liberals within the church and they describe more than each other, and all that, you know. Um, and so, in some ways, it's a perfect organization to express Howling's view of life, where ideas are in the background, some people are purely animated by them, but they're very rare, and even they can be lying to themselves, and he's rather pocket by sort of view of the way things happen. But in actual fact, his three books, which if I was to put them on this so far here, would be at least this high, all three of them. Uh, and yet, it seems such a dry subject, the internal high, high politics of the semi-aristocratic leadership of the Anglican Church for 150 years. You know, most of them, the undergraduates, you know, be gagging just with that description. And yet, it's, it's a fascinating collection of books. Because the characters of these men, the intellectual violence of their disputes, the belief that they influence the inner mindset of the inner elite of the empire of our state. And that's what Gary is concerned about. He's not concerned about the masses belief. The masses belief, what they're told to believe. He's a pure elitist. 80% of people have no ideas and just conform to the political correctness of the hour. They conform to the liberal humanist DC rhetoric now, which seems as a telling towards women and every other media, because they are going to conform to whatever view. If they would have conformed as they did in the past to a national, semi racial, patriotic, old style view of Britain, which is now regarded by many people as a slightly monstrous attitude, although probably in its heart, it's what people like how they are really believed about this country and how. And just the truth of the Now, these books are his constructivist attempt, they might be. These books are his attempt to put forward his agenda. Um, the dilemma he faces, of course, is almost a complete liberal takeover of the mental space of the Anglican Church. But of course, because he believes that ideas dominate the mind, and the mind is the subconscious of the brain, and therefore what elite brains think is of importance way out of proportion to the small number of people they talk to and write for. Because he believes rather like uh, uh, Shelley, who said, uh, who said that the poet of the NFL is so disabled in mankind. He believes that people who produce theories through which all the other more middling minds keep in sync control the agenda. They don't control it in any personal way, it's not their property, but they control the agreement and the nature of the debate. The total collapse of Anglicanism into liberalism, the total collapse into secular humanism, whereby almost any Christian element is completely removed. Whereas the important thing about religion from uh, the powers of this world is its mysticism, is its irrationalism, its appeal to that which is beyond and therefore can't be argued about, its hieratic possibilities. That element that says believe and is beyond the day. So you have this strange element, which is always the paradox of the intellectual, particularly the role of willful intellectual position. But a man who's well, as theoretical as anyone you could ever meet ends up justifying the organicism of belief and the leap into faith that Peter Garvin had there, beyond any possibility of complete, well, complete rational gainsaying, uh, denial, equivocation, or misstatement. You come back irreducibly to, in all right wing thinking, how are they, what do you to base hierarchy upon? What do you to base the possibility of transcendence within hierarchy upon? For of course, law, systems of faith. If systems of faith, what system of faith and for why? And how are people to believe in it at the level of an elite, an intermediate or middling group, very important in modern societies, of course, now dominant culturally, and the majority? And how do you hold these people together? And what for? And can I be happy that in enough to say what value do we sell them in order to hold them together? Because he believed politics was partly about that. When people he used to see a very contemptuous of the idea that they because he calls you such a bias, you know, they're such fools. And he would say, Look, they are moving within a vortex of power where they have to face off against three or four different tendencies, some of which may resort certainly outside of this country, speaking for years back. 
to physical violence. And there's no freedom of truth in that area. That's not what they're for. That's the role of the philosopher, or a philosopher king, to some extent. Not a British cabinet minister in the 1930s. I once asked him what his view of the extreme right was, and he said, what do you mean people like Mosley? And I said, yes, and he said, well, he said, they're essentially movements that are cut off from what I consider the right to do. And although Mosley came from the inner aristocracy, of course. And he said, they're essentially, when you go outside Parliament, when you go outside the structures of the British establishment, this is his thinking, you go into the working class, you go to the man. And they never have any power. They can create a lot of force, but they never have come to power in our country. During the revolution, the world of political sort that we had 400 years ago, the masses were energized just for a small moment, and then the dictatorship closed once the monarchy had been removed. And once the dictators were dead, some were put on. Uh, in by the Army Council, they realised he was a fool and a weakling, tumbled down dead, and they got their monarchy back very quickly. How can you prove that? These radical parliamentarians and Puritans and ideologues of faith realised there was no strong man to hold it together, so they immediately opened up to the old order again and said, We take you back, there will be no recrimination, there will be no show trial, the man stood for the execution of one king stood to salute another one coming in. That was the elixir of Englishness, as uh, Howell regards it. The ability to, even in very uh, theoretical minds, even with very theoretical intellectual position minds, to put that intellectual on no account in moments of national strife, and to embrace the reasons which in a way are sometimes purely physiological and irrational viewed in liberal, rational, humanist terms, where every decision that every person makes is based upon a rational calculation of utility, of outcome, the moral notion which is very consequent to liberal thinking now, philosophically and ethically, or consequentialism, whereby all that ever matters is the consequences of a particular action. The type of reversal of the prior religious view, that what matters is intention. If you run a child over and it means that it's a mass cause, which is punished in most Western jurisdictions in a quite minor way. So that's a bit, you know, sort of the word drive mother of the child to see my neighbor. Whereas if it can be proved intentionally the prior to put his foot down because he's been writing on a blog out, he's just like that child and this sort of thing, and there's intention there, then that is completely different and conceived as such. So if you have an intention that lies behind an action, from the religious view, everything is prior. And the more radical the religiosity, the more the meaning of life is determined before one even starts thinking about how one might agree or disagree with that. The liberal view, that you have heuristic where everything thinks you make much go along, that everything's relative in relation to everything else, that life is existential and not essential, is the opposite of what you believe. And so in a strange way, you end up with very theoretical, very abstract ideas based upon empiricism, based upon deep historical knowledge of texts and analysis of the psychological motivations of individual politicians and clerics, most of whom no one's ever heard of. Now, how a guy, years ago, who got some major obituaries in the Times and in the Telegraph, a radical important. He certainly, in my view, misunderstood the libertarians who largely taken over the Tory party uh, in the post-war period although he would have analysed them quite correctly as extremist liberals of a different sort. Um, he didn't quite realise that the ruthlessness and the ability to shape shift and change positions, which you've seen Michael Patillo more from a right, allegedly right-wing Tory defence minister and hate figure of the left, to Diane Abbott, Beck May, if they sit together on a good way in television studio. This strange transformation that's occurred Cameron was a part of would actually be amazed by the extraordinary cynicism um, in such a mood for a man who professed hard age, no nonsense, cynicism, and a complete sort of spare, unchuckling attitude towards me. This is that's an interesting parallel. The cynicism of um what intellectuals called ordinary people can often take the breath their way from the intellectual cynic. That um, that's an interesting conceit just as intellectuals can change their position so quickly in a way that we doubt with people, 
Well, they're not dominated by that idiot. I remember I went to what's called the salon when I was 18. And I realised that people who call themselves intellectuals have their own class system. They talk about intellectuals and ordinary people. That's just amazing, ordinary people. I suddenly realised the world was divided for them into those who live purely and only for the mind and the rest. All groups have their inclusions and their exclusions, because you can't have discourse without it. All groups rely on ordering who's in the group, who's outside the group, and so on. Um, so I think he misinterpreted the changes in the Conservative Party, which in some ways was his great hope. His great hope is the Conservative Party has no views. The Conservative Party is here. And therefore, in his way of looking at it, anyone can come to power with it. He'd be very displeased with me. He'd say, I don't say, you know he'd say, you've been a fool, he said. You've been too honest. Honest is never a good idea in politics. Yeah, this is his hearing. He said, you should completely give him what your actual views are. He said, you've been mentally extreme as a politician and gone out to the fringe of this thing. And you've stayed inside and chiseled your way out. This is his way of thinking. But the problem with that view is you have to lead to the Tory MP and others. In the old days, they could have their little groups like the Monkey Club and so on on the right end of the Tory party. Those groups don't exist anymore. You would have the funny uh, element that when he ended up and became leader and the party voted for him to be leader because he was getting all the people who were members of the party and they wanted him. And then they realised he was sort of sort of rushed into the people in this block of wood, you know, and was sort of completely unelectable in mass terms. <laughs> and there was a coup. All the forces just got together in the bottom, never mind the tent, never mind the public, and had a coup to get out of it because he was just uh, a bit freer with the media. And in a strange sort of way, that sort of palace coup is the sort of politics that Calvin lived and breathed. But I think he misunderstood the importance of mass society. I think in, in poetry modernity, a great modernity, he overestimated the corridors of power and the influence of tiny little microscopic elites and the divisions between them. I think possibly before 1924, I don't forget most of these books, are written in the politics that precedes the modern world as we can see it now. His way of looking at things is much more salient. But now I think increasingly it doesn't matter. I consider this country is ruled by one party that has three wings. And the little Democrats are in the middle and swivel and provide the ideas for the other two blocks, although they can't get in, get in, get in, except in terms of goals of another terrible one. And the blocks are class, the blocks are class based. Centre right, the south of England and in Byron, the British World Club, centre left, the north of England, southern Wales, the bigger cities, and so on. And they move around each other. But ideologically, these, all of these parties, push together, believing 80%. They're all secularists, they're all humanists, they're all egalitarian, they're great, they're all uh, in favor of the EU, they're all in favor of multiculturalism, they're all in favor of multiracialism, you have multiculturalism because you have multiracialism, not the other way around, and so on. They're all in favor of this. As you go out from all the margins of the Labour Party, the, 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 the American domination of the consensus that exists, that becomes more rancid, that becomes more adversarial, and the people just drop away there. And that is true. And there are other areas where that needle model, the needle model is all the great down in the But that, the problem is people, I think that's true, people are ruled by one party for three wins. And um, I don't think he really grasped that. So, like all political things, there's some political philosophers, there's um, the there's, there's sort of Wagnerian moments at the end, you know? People who sat with him in Ohio, in South Down, when he lost that seat in Northern Ireland, at the Coast Line, the Democratic Union, but now the Hegemonic Party, in my speaking, is in Northern Ireland. Run over the capital against him, because he didn't like him, because he was an Englishman, and an outsider, and somebody who advocated fusion to the rest of Britain, where they wanted to dissolve the Protestant power inside Ulster. All these divisions that don't match any of these things, the people over here, but so that was absolutely crucial. You know, and as Powell sat there, watching the votes, watching the fact that he holds his career in the same thing, he said that um, 
almost could create anything by it. And of course, that is true, that is a certain view of this, metaphysically. Because all these people, with the exception of the most radically totalitarian elements within fascistic ideas, the right is anti utopian. We don't believe other bit human beings, you know, they don't capable of perfection. Uh, and all attempts to do that are a procrastinian day, essentially, you know, the body is practical there, you know, and the best job of people are now at big. And um, that's that he is ultimately the most radical left wing mind. And so in a sense, a slightly morbid pessimistic attitude towards human quality and the imperfection of those directions is right wing. And now how does it influence I think it's interesting because despite the belief system, despite the fact that very few people outside academic life have heard of them, despite the fact that um, these are difficult and critically custom on the page that in life, he does point to one interesting thing, and that's the combination of metaphysical historicism and right wing radicalism with pure theory. The rejection of Buddhism and anti-intellectuality which are largely associated with conservatives. So many people sit on the left. Many people I'm sure in their group groups when they were young, because they thought that life wasn't interesting. I wasn't interested in ideas. Don't forget many people's ideas, they're quite superficial. Why do you think that when I'm the university, the left dominated everything? Absolutely everything. Now the left, in a hard way, is very small, very technical. I'm a lecturer in sociology. Did you hear what that chap said? But they don't forget the person who 
uh, at least sort of sacred monastery, right? Three people are going and writing in, in politics. One's called Ivan Pound, one is called Morris Cat, and somebody else who very interested in, you very well known. There's a man called Bill Hopkins, in the world, she was one of the angry young men. And um, he's a very interesting poem, all that in the world. But, um, and so, but what I'll say is that the importance of these great, the importance of these great sacred monsters of the British intellectual right, you won't hear these names on Radio 4, you won't hear these names in the government, you won't hear these names in the new statesmen. It's as if these individuals have been aired by transit history, but they're still there, and they do represent either something of flying that can be left for the future, or the echoes, the last enders of what this stuff once was. The well, the Daily Mail would, we went for the mail. The problem with populist discourse, though, is you have to deny that you're a monster, and, and you have to simplify things to such a level. But he, he would have written for the sun, as Cal did, as Adam Clark did. Write for the sun, write for the science history supplement. Why not? You know, when you write for the Daily Mail, there's a red book. Red book, of course, for the mirror. Every sentence, has to be comprehensible to a 14 year old child. No sense it's not going to be long to This is the journalist who instructed it's on their screens. I was once taken around the sun in Watkin by um, Gary Bushnell, who was well known to have a certain attitude to a certain thought. And Gary said, Oh, we're down to nothing, we're now on 88 grand a year, he said. For what? In answer. You know, <laughs> I, I run them all the news there. <laughs> And it sounds like interesting that half of them have a little bit of a great size on them, they're all public school boys. And half of them are working class little white boys. And it's this old combination. And in the background, you have, you know, so they might have to or something. You know, they have the most famous um, front pages, all round in an office, it's one of these ghastly over the flag offices, where no one has any privacy, and everyone eating their parents up with your machine and sort of. Bush will took me round. To, to look at these things. And it was quite interesting, this pound is the right of the sun, and the sun is the right of the sun. And the sun has a blue book, not a blue book of the mirror, where every sentence is supposed to be comprehensible for a nine year old. For a nine year old. And if you put scripts through to the sun, it's got a semi candle on it, they send it back. They say, what are you doing? You know, send it back. What can I say? <laughs> and, uh, and I say, my talent would have found that sort of atmosphere a bit difficult. But still, ideas communicate at different levels. He can be as close to our argues. He brings up here, most people are down here. They're feeling physical. So what, uh, what happens up here builds us down to them. So, I very pleased to address a group of uh, uh, young people, young educated people, and the future it is, um, is your generation. If this society will either go with a bang or a whimper in the middle of this century, with that goes for 40 years, I'll be 90 by then. Um, and you'll be the sort of, uh, you know, a bit younger than that. So it's a major time is coming. I, to finish, I believe that if we were in 1909, not 2009, when this century ago, no one could predict what was coming. The first war was coming, the depression was coming, the second war was coming, there was collapse of the traditional European society in this country, which had appeared, of course, was coming. The social, cultural, sexual, psychological revolution of the 1960s was coming. It's all coming. And yet no one in 1909 would really know that. And I think here, in 2009, change is totally different change, but change is as radical are coming. Make sure your ideas influence them. Thank you very much.